and we're gonna get started. Um, so today's plan, we're gonna get back to the anterior medial leg musculature. Um, we're gonna continue on into the adductor region, which we never had a chance to cover last time. Um, we're also gonna look at femur osteology, so the femur itself and the landmarks that I'd like to talk about because they are actually related to the muscles that we're gonna go through today. Um, we're also gonna go over the difference between the tendons and the ligaments. And we're gonna be covering a full lecture of posterior thigh. So hopefully I can get all that done today. Wish me luck and uh, let's get started. So pretty busy slide. Um, don't worry too much about all these structures. The important landmarks are the things I, got, I want you guys to focus on. So I want you to find the greater and the lesser trochanters or trochanters, depending on how you wanna pronounce it. Um, the greater one is to the very top left of the anterior view of the right femur. So this is the right femur. And this one over here is also the right femur, but they flipped it around and we're looking at the posterior view of it on the right over here. So on the anterior view, you have what is known as a greater trochanter. And this is a very important bony landmark because certain muscles attach here and we'll talk about them in a bit. But in order to find the greater trochanter, what you guys can actually do is either sitting or uh, most likely standing will probably be the best way to find it. But if you were to find your iliac crests right now that we talked about in lecture two, and then you just move a little bit more inferiorly, the next bump that you should feel if you, go, if you guys move inferiorly to the lateral aspect of your iliac crest is your greater trochanter. And that's actually part of your femur. Now the greater trochanter is important because it's a place of uh, attachment for very important muscles. Um, it's also implicated in pathology quite a bit, um, primarily a bursitis. Um, there's a bursa that sits on top of it. We haven't really touched upon bur bursa just yet. I don't really want to get into it too, too much. Um, bursa is a fluid filled sac that is normally not too filled with fluid. It's pretty much like a cushion. Like if you guys can imagine um, like those little popcorn things they put in boxes or nowadays they use the fluid filled bags to kind of you know cushion whatever's inside the contents of an Amazon box um, that would kind of be like what a bursa would do so it's usually found between bony ends and muscles or bones and tendons and it's just a way to space them out a little bit um, in pathology they get filled up with liquids um, in an inflamed state um, due to poor position of the thigh um, but that's one thing. And I think the bursa over there is also called the trochanteric bursa. I just want to make sure I don't want to give you false information. Yes. So trochanteric bursa, I'll type that in the group chat. And it's often in, in, implicated in bursitis. So itis meaning inflammation, bursa, so inflammation of the bursa. Now, if there's a greater trochanter, there's also a lesser trochanter. And if you guys look at the anterior view, you can kind of see it medially over here, but you see it a little bit better posteriorly, that lesser trochanter, that nice bony prominence over here. And that's also a very important attachment point. Now, another thing I want you guys to take note of is the longer neck that the femur has, as opposed to its analogous structure in the upper body, which is a humerus. Um, both of them had the neck, but the, the, the femur has a longer one. And that does a few things. A, it contributes to that cueing that we talked about. So when we're looking straight at the femur, it does angle inwardly, and that's very normal. And that's a, the third point I made over here. It has a pretty big angle to it. Um, but it's also um, implicated in pathology. So if you guys were ever to hear about a hip fracture, um, this is the point where they often fracture that neck over here that's where um, especially when you're at advanced age the density of the tissue over here becomes very very low um, and it serves as a very very obvious uh, breakage point for the femur and the last thing i want you guys to know about the femur osteology are the different lines lips tubercles and tuberosities Right, so we already talked about the greater and the lesser trochanters. We also got the lines over here. So we got a medial and a lateral lip of the linea aspera. Um, these are also attachment points for muscles. We got the pectineal line, which is an attachment for the pectineus, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, so right over here. 
Um, and then we also got one more thing. What was I looking for? I think that's about it. And then if you look at the bottom sur surface over here, you start to see the epicondyles of the femur. So those are like those bony lateral bumps over here. And if you look over here, we, we see what is known as the patellar surface. This is where your kneecap would be sitting. So this is where the kneecap articulates or the patellar articulates with the femur. And then if you look at the posterior aspect of the femur over here, you can see that the medial and the lateral condyles are the distal most part of the femur. And this is what articulates with your tibia, the superior aspect of your tibia. So this is what joins your shin bone over here. All right, now let's look at the difference between tendons and ligaments. So what I did was I kind of color coded this. Anything that's colored blue is a ligament. Anything that's colored red is a tendon. Um, so let's look at a few examples. Um, at the very top proximal portion, you can see, I don't know if that's in the way for you guys, but you can see up here, we got the ligaments of the hips. So the ligaments that attach the femur to the acetabulum, which is that articulating surface of the pelvis that the femur articulates with. Um, and if you look down here, we got the fect, uh, rectus femoris tendon right over here, just superior to the patella. Now it's cut and redacted, but you can imagine that the rectus femoris would continue along here and attach to the AIIS of the pelvis, the anterior inferior iliac spine. Okay. We got the fibular collateral ligament over here, which attaches the lateral condyle of the femur to the fibular head. So another name for this, and you guys will recognize this, is the LCL. Okay. And in contrast to the LCL, we also have an MCL, and that's a tibial collateral ligament. Um, yes, yes, we're looking at the anterior view of the right leg at the moment. I know it's a little hard to orient yourself sometimes, but see if you, if you guys can use bony landmarks, right? So um, if we're looking at, let's say, the rectus femoris muscle, so I'll, I'll give you guys a few clues, actually. Um, good question, by the way. Um, so if we're looking at the rectus femoris, we know that the rectus femoris is more of an anterior muscle because it extends the knee. It also sits in front of the, uh, in front of the leg. So that gives us a clue that we're looking at the anterior view. Now, to determine if we're looking at the right or the left leg, you got to look at a few things. So we know over here that we got the greater trochanter sitting off to this side, right? So we also know that the fibula is on this side, whereas the tibia is on this side. So if we know that the fibula is lateral, we know that we're looking at the right leg. Because if we're looking at the left leg, things would be flipped. So you'd see the you see the fibula on the inside over here, and you see the greater trochanter on the inside. So always try to look for a landmark, guys, when determining if it's an anterior view, as well as whether you're looking at the right or the left leg. Good question, though. Okay, so, and we also got a few other things. So um, we got the ligament over here. We got the patella ligament connecting the patella to your tibial tuberosity, so that bony prominence of the tibia. And we got some more tendons in red over here. And if you guys can see at the very right, we got that pes anserinus that we're going to talk about in the next slide. But anyways, um, the major differences between tendons and ligaments are to the left over here. So tendons attach muscle to bone versus a ligament that attaches a bone to bone. So that's the major difference. Um, now more functionally, tendons, people often think of tendons as things that just, you know, are continuous with muscle, but they do offer dynamic support whereas ligaments offer passive support. Now, what do I mean by dynamic and passive? Dynamic means tendons offer support in a way where it controls the movement of something. So let's say you want to throw a kick, right? You're gonna kick up really hard, right? But in order to kick your leg up, certain muscles have to contract and certain muscles have to stretch to allow that to happen, right? Now the muscles that are stretching, so if you're kicking straight ahead, um, the back of your leg is going to be stretching, right? Because um, that's what's going to allow you to lift up your leg. Those tendons in the back of the leg have to stretch, but also prevent overstretch. So that's what I mean by dynamic support. Versus 
um, ligaments where they offer a passive support. Um, and that's because they don't actually bend or anything. They just check things. They're kind of like a rope. They're very ropey in the structure. And that's the next point over here. Tendons are elastic tissue. They have um, a, a chemical in their collagen called elastin. Don't worry about that. That's more molecular biology. Um, but in any case, um, that's what gives the, the tendon its stretchy nature. And so it contracts, kind of like the muscle, right? And it usually contracts in the same direction as the muscle, whereas ligaments are non-elastic uh, tissue, so they don't contract. They're more like a rope and less like an elastic band. Um, the last difference, and this is just more so nomenclature than anything else, is that when a tendon is torn, it leads to a sprain, whereas when a ligament is torn, it leads to a strain. So if you ever hear a sprain, think of tendons. If you ever hear of a strain, think of a ligament. Now, a sprain with a P also refers to a muscle as well, so you can sprain your muscle. Wait, did I get that mixed up? I think I did. Sorry, guys. Yeah, you know what? Big mistake. Flip these two. So <laughs> a sprain <laughs> refers to ligaments. A strain refers to tendons, okay? So let me write that down. Sorry about the mistake there. Oh, don't read that either. Wow. I really need coffee. So you strain your tendons, but you sprain your ligaments. Let's see if I could delete the mistake I made there. Oh, geez. So look at my last two messages, guys. Sorry about that. And the T and strain and the T and tendon. Yeah, I agree, Sarah. So like Sarah said, um, just remember the T in strain and T in tendon. Tendon starts with T, so that's a great way to remember it. Um, but yeah, just uh, try to change that in your slides. I'll change it in mine right now before I forget because I know I will if I don't. Cool. Moving on. So, Pez and Serenus. And my first question is, did you guys actually Google it? I'm going to assume a lot of you didn't because it was a hefty lecture last time and it was a bit of a rush. So um, if you did, good on you. If not, we're going to talk about it anyways. Um, the Pez and Serenus is a common insertion point for three major muscles that course along the leg. And it's medial. It's a medial aspect of your knee. So... The top diagram over here, we're looking at the front on anterior view of the right knee. And the bottom diagram, we're looking at the medial view of that same right knee. And the biggest thing you can notice is that all these muscles are pretty long and they all originate from the three different parts of the pelvis. So the long one over here is the longest one of the human body and you can see why it's a sartorius, that's S. It originates from that ASIS, the anterior in, uh, superior iliac spine. It goes all the way down into the medial aspect of the knee at that pes anserinus portion. We also have the gracilis, which originates from the pubis of the pelvis and goes all the way down attached to the same point. And last but not least, this is a muscle we haven't talked about yet. It's semitendinosus. It's one of our hamstring muscles. We're going to talk about it at the end of the lecture. It originates from the ischium at the ischial tuberosity and also attaches to that same point in the medial knee. And the reason they call it pes anserinus is because it is, it looks like a goose's foot and that's what it literally translates into. So if you guys know Latin or if you want to look it up, it's they, a lot of the times in anatomy, they call things based on how they actually look. And I guess the guys that invented this name thought this attachment point looked like a goose's foot. So that's where the name is. Now, these three muscles all have different nerves too. So do you guys remember which nerve innervates sartorius? Let's see if this is a difficult question or an easy one. Might be a difficult one actually, but let's, let's see if you guys remember. This is from last lecture. So what nerve innervates the sartorius muscle, that long muscle? We called it the 
Taylor's muscle too. It's a muscle that contracts when we cross our legs while we sit. It flexes the hip as well as it externally rotates the hip. So what innervates the sartorius muscle? Let's get some answers here. I'm just gonna open the window, it's kind of hot in here. Awesome. So we got a few answers already. And you guys are absolutely right. It is the femoral nerve. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, it is the femoral nerve, guys. Um, I'm glad you guys got the answer. No one got it wrong. That's awesome. Um, the other two muscles we're going to talk about today, so I'm not going to give you the nerves just yet, but they also have different nerves that innervate them. All right, moving on to the anterior hip flexors. So um, we kind of touched about upon the psoas and iliacus last time, but I want to kind of get into it a little bit more again. Um, the psoas has both a major and a minor aspect to it. That's why I have the plus and minus sign, right? Um, the psoas minor doesn't really cross the hip, but the psoas major does. And then we talked about, so psoas would be this muscle over here. See how it kind of originates from the lumbar vertebrae? And it kind of courses down here to join with the iliacus, which is that muscle that in, in, uh, kind of originates from the iliac crest. Okay. And they both move distally until they attach to the lesser trochanter of the femur. So if we go back to our lecture over here, lecture slide over here, that's that lesser trochanter now. That's one. That's where the iliopsoas attaches to. And these are the biggest hip flexors we have in the body um, because they generate the most force. Plus, they have the biggest muscle mass. Um, now, my question to you guys is. We know that the iliopsoas is a very strong hip flexor, but what other hip flexors are in the body? I'm looking for three other muscles that you guys can name. So what other muscles cause hip flexion? Yeah, so it, it's, it's weird for the attachment point, so I'm just answering another question. So does this attach posteriorly? Yes. It crosses over, it has to cross over posteriorly, right? But most of the muscle bulk is anteriorly. So because it's anteriorly, it causes hip flexion. But you're right. This is the posterior aspect. It's actually posterior medial. So what the iliopsoas has to do is it originates up top over here and it moves distally down through here and around the neck and attaches to the lesser trochanter over here. So you're absolutely right. So I'm waiting for three more hip flexors. Haven't got any answers yet, I'm surprised. Okay, good, good. Yep, you guys got all the answers, you see? You guys are good. All right, so we got the rectus femoris, the tensor fascia lata, and the sartorius. And if iliacus is the strongest hip flexor, the second strongest would be the rectus femoris by far due to sheer muscle bulk. Um, and between TFL and sartorius, I'm not sure which one would be the stronger hip flexor. I would guess Sartorius just positionally has a longer muscle, but who knows? But you guys got it. So rectus femoris, TFL, Sartorius, and iliopsoas are the four hip flexors. And then you guys, anytime you guys hear of tight hip flexors or um, anterior hip impingement, we're often referring to these muscles. Cool. 
So let's get into the medial thigh now. So we finished the anterior hip and the anterior thigh. We're going more into the medial thigh or another way to call it is the groin area. Um, these are the muscles that course in between the legs. And one of the things that are common for most of them is that they're innervated by the obturator nerve. And if you guys remember from lecture one, I believe, when we talked about the lumbosacral plexus, that obturator nerve innervates from L2, L3, and L4 nerve roots. And it makes its way through the pelvis and through that obturator foramen, that small little circle over here. So Not sure where that's not sure. So if you guys can take a look over here, I'm just gonna start this show from here. So, so that obturator foramen, we're looking at the lateral aspect of the pelvis. This is from before. That's the obturator foramen over here. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now. That's weird. I can't do two shows. I can't start two slideshows simultaneously, unfortunately, so I have to like go back and forth. So that's an obturator foramen. So that nerve travels through and that's why it gets its name. Um, it innervates most of these adductor muscles. So ADD, meaning the muscles contract to bring the leg closer to midline. Um, they also cause some flexion in the hip. They're not strong flexors, but they do cause some and immediately rotate the hip joint. Now there's a strike through over here I was actually supposed to put a slash laterally rotate the hip, and we're gonna talk about why in a bit, but for now, they, they're, they're the major adductors of the hip. That's all you gotta know for now. So we're gonna look at the musculature that's in the medial thigh, and we're gonna start probably, let's start over here with the gracilis. Um, that's that muscle in the green over here. It's the medial most out of all these, um, it has a very long tendon, um, particularly at, at its distal most point over here. And it's sometimes used as a tendon to replace the ACL when you damage your ACL. Although ACL reconstructions are primarily done with your patellar tendon or your hamstring tendon, but sometimes they'll use a gracilis tendon. Um, due to its low muscle mass size, um, it's not really a strong adductor. Um, but again, we talked about the gracilis um being one of those muscles so let's go back over here the gracilis is this muscle over here as well it's one of those muscles that attach to the pes anserinus so it's one of those pes anserinus muscles that attach to the medial thigh okay now if we go a little bit more to the medial aspect over here we get this muscle called the pectineus and it's the shortest of all the adductor muscles um, it's a small muscle over here. It, uh, you have to dip pretty deep to see this muscle anatomically, um, but it originates from that superior rat pubic ramus. So if I go back to, let's go back to this lecture because it's important to kind of refer back to the things. Um, if you refer back to this side over here, the superior ramus of the pubis would be over here. And then the inferior ramus would be over here. Superior because it's higher up, inferior because it's lower down. Okay, so another image is over here, and this is kind of the muscle cut out. So you can see the two ends, but the, the muscle body is cut out. But over here, you can kind of see that attachment to that superior pubic ramus of the pelvis, and um, it adducts the hip, but that's pretty much all it does. It's a small muscle. Now, if we go a little bit more distally, we start getting to the adductor groups. Okay, so the first one we see is the adductor longus. Um, it gets its name because it inducts the hip, but it's also pretty long. Um, the main function is to adduct the hip, although it does participate in flexion and medial and lateral rotation of your hip, depending upon the position of the hip. And I have a question over here. Oh, Good question, Tara. Sorry, I forgot to mention. So um, it originates from the superior pubic ramus over here, the, the pectineus, and it attaches to the pectineal line of the femur. So let's go back to the osteology portion of the lecture. So if you guys look over here, we have what is known as pectineal line. Sorry, over here. 
And that's where the pectineus would attach. Right over here. Cool. No problem. Okay, so longus. So yeah, longus originates from this portion over here. It's that same superior ramus. Um, now, this is the first muscle we talked about so far where the joint position kind of dictates what it does in terms of motion, um, which is really weird. We haven't talked about a muscle yet that depending on the position of joint, it changes what it does. So um, there's a lot of research going on as to, you know, basically they're called EMG studies where they hook electrodes to the muscle. And when they cause the joint to move, they'll see how much activity is in the muscle. Um, they've determined that the adductor long longus is mostly a lateral rotator, but in some positions of hip flexion, it actually becomes an internal rotator. Okay. And you're going to notice that about a few muscles in the lower extremity as well, that the action changes based on the position of the joint. And that's because of leverage and where it's pulling from, right? So don't get confused as to what exactly it does. It's primarily an adductor of the hip, meaning if you were to have the leg out to the side, it contracts to bring it back in, right? That's all I really want you guys to know. But an interesting thing is muscles do change in how they cause motion or activate based on the position they may be in at the time. That's kind of the main thing I want you to get from that. Um, now, a little bit further down, we got brevis. So if there's a longus, we always have to have a brevis, right? Brevis means the short version. We have to get deep for the brevis. We're getting a little deeper now. And um, it's below both the pectineus and the longus aspect. So adductor brevis is right over here in the purple. And it arises actually in the lower part now in the from the inferior ramus of the pubic um, bone. So right over here, as opposed to the superior ramus. So inferior ramus and attaches to the medial aspect of the femur over there. And again, for, sorry, there's another question. What was the other movement? So the two movements that the adductor longus are, uh, the adductor longus muscle kind of completes other than addu adduction and hip flexion is lateral rotation and sometimes medial rotation. But I think the answer you're looking for is it's also a hip flexor. So it takes that leg and brings it closer towards your chest. That would be hip flexion. Now question guys, when I, when I say like hip flexion, external rotation, abduction, adduction, you guys can kind of visualize what I'm talking about or would it be helpful to kind of place, let's say a diagram next to what I'm talking about showing the movement as well. Would that be helpful? Let me know in the comment section. So if that would be helpful for you guys, I might start doing that. Um, I'm so used to the motion, so I never really think about it, but if it would be helpful for you guys where I could put a picture of the, um, of the actual motion, I could definitely do it. Okay, so already some yeses. Okay, cool, no problem. All right, so everyone say yes. <laughs> okay, so I gotta get out of my mind and start start thinking that everyone else who hasn't been exposed to these motions, you know, probably need a helpful diagram that might make it a little bit easier to understand. Okay, perfect, perfect, no problem. Um, sorry about that, guys. So I'll start adding the motions to the slides as well. So it becomes a little bit easier to kind of visualize what these muscles are doing. Awesome. All right, cool. So we got the longest and then again, the longest attaches. So it starts from that superior slash inferior, almost at the border between the superior and inferior pubic ramus and attaches to the linea aspera of the femur. So if we go back to the femur diagram, that linea aspera is right over here. We have the lateral and the medial hip lip, and I'm pretty sure it attaches to the medial lip right over here. Okay. All right, and the magnus. So magnus means it's just bigger than everyone else. Okay. It's both a long and a large muscle. It actually arises from the ischium. So the ischium is that kind of bottom portion over here ischial tuberosity and ischial tuberosity once again guys is that sitting bone that's that bone that we sit on it adducts the hip as well as extends it depending on which part of the muscle you're looking at so 
This muscle is special because although it is one muscle, two parts of the muscle do different things and it doesn't depend on joint position anymore. It doesn't matter which position the joint is in, it will still do two different things, okay? So I'm not trying to confuse you guys. I promise the body is just that complicated sometimes. And I'll explain why. We're gonna look at it in more isolation, each and every one of these guys. But just know that Magnus has a portion that adducts the hip, that we call the adductor portion, and it has a portion that extends the hip, which we call the hamstring portion. Okay. Um, now it spreads itself to the larger aspect of the posterior surface um, of the femur over here. And what you'll notice over here is that it has a hole in it. So I put a little bit of a hexagon and inside of it, you'll actually see a hole in the muscle. And we call it an adductor hiatus, or I don't know how, you, however else you can pronounce it. I call it hiatus. Um, but anytime you hear the word hiatus, think of a think of a hole in a muscle. So this is not the only hiatus we have in the human body. Another very common one that people are aware of is the diaphragm, the, the diaphragm hiatus. So the hole in the diaphragm that allows your eating tube, the esophagus, to kind of move through. Um, so we, we also have one in the adductor magnus, which is called the adductor hiatus. Now, um, hiatuses are usually made in muscles to allow things, important things to move through. In this case, we're talking about very important blood vessels that have to go through it. Um, and then the analogous form of a hiatus to a bone would be a foramen. So anytime you think of a hole in a bone, think of foramen. And we talked about that obturative foramen over here, right? Anytime you think of a hole in a muscle, think of hiatus, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about these arteries and vessels in a bit, but the femoral artery and vein go through this hole, and the moment they pass through this hole, their name changes to the popliteal artery and vein, okay? So it also serves as a kind of um, way to change the nomenclature of a vein or an artery. Um, so keep that in mind as well. And the common nerve that kind of innervates most of these muscles is the obturator nerve. But we'll talk about certain exceptions to that rule. Okay. So in this slide, I kind of want to give you an idea of all the layers of the muscles. Because um, they're not all in the same plane, right? If you look at a diagram like this, it's kind of, sorry, the previous one. So if you look at a diagram like this, it's kind of hard to see the planes. So here's a better illustration of the different planes, right? Superficially, we have pectineus, adductor longus, and gracilis. These are the most superficial medial thigh muscles, right? These are the ones that you'll see first if you were to remove the skin off of the thigh, at least the medial thigh that is, right? Now, um, again, uh, this is the first layer. Uh, pectineus is up really high over here in the green. It's a superior most. Um, the longest is almost on the same plane in terms of, you know, superior, inferior. And then the gracilis is the medial most muscle over here. Now, if you remove these muscles out of the way, then you'll see adductor brevis, which is deeper to layer one. So layer two is brevis. And if you remove brevis out of the way, although you, you wouldn't have to because Magnus is pretty big, Brevis only covers a portion of it, but if you remove brevis out of the way, you'll get into layer three, which is that huge magnus, adductor magnus muscle. Okay. Um, now, most of these muscles are innervated by the obturator nerve, except for pectineus. So um, I wrote down here that the biggest and the smallest muscles think they're special. The smallest muscle is pectineus. Um, it's special because it's the only one that gets innervated by the femoral nerve because it's small and due to its proximity to the femoral nerve. Um, now, the bigger muscle, the adductor manus, magnus, we talked about it having two functional parts, right? So one part of the adductor magnus is the adductor portion, and one part is the hamstring portion. And the adductor portion of adductor magnus is innervated by the obturator nerve, whereas the hamstring portion of the adductor manus, magnus is innervated by a sciatic nerve. Okay, and I'll show you guys right now how that looks if we look at the adductor magnus in isolation. 
Okay, so we got the posterior view of the right leg over here, so the right thigh. Now, can you guys give me clues as to why we're looking at the posterior and not the, let's say, anterior view of the leg right now? What are some clues? Let's 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 hear what you guys have to say. What are some clues that we're looking at the posterior and not the anterior aspect of the leg? And I'll give you a clue. Take a look at the femur right now. So especially the distal, distal aspect, right? Where the head of the humerus is, yeah. Where are the greater trochanters located, lesser trochanter? Good, good. Although it's this, this diagram is such a poor one. Yes, where the greater trochanter is located will give you an idea of whether we're looking at the right or left leg, I guess. Um, it's the lesser trochanter that we know is located more posteriorly. So if these muscles be out of the way, that'd be the case. Um, with the shape of the pelvis, yeah, yeah. Um, the anterior view does not look like the posterior view. No visible kneecap, yes, awesome. So if you look over here at the distal aspect of this diagram, and this is a horrible diagram, right? Like it's, it's not great, but you still have clues, right? So if you look over here, we, we actually don't see any kneecap. And what we do see is actually the condyles of the femur that are pretty much more visible posteriorly. So if we go back up over here, you see how the condyles are more visible posteriorly? Anteriorly, not as much, but posteriorly, they got more of that roundiness to it and they're more exposed and you got that deep intracondylar fossa over there. Um, that would be another hint, as well as a missing kneecap. Awesome. So those are all great answers, guys. And different ones too, which I, which I was kind of looking for. Um, it just goes to show that there's so many different ways to kind of visualize things and clue in on what you're looking at, which is awesome. Position of the tib and fib. Yes, but we haven't explained why. So um, fibula articulates with the tibia more anteriorly, right? So you can see how the tibia is kind of cutting up the fibula to some extent. That will give another clue. It also gives us a clue as to which leg we're looking at too, right? So we know that the fibula is more lateral to the uh, tibia and if we know we're looking at the posterior aspect if we're looking back to the leg and this is lateral this has to be the right knee or the right leg awesome you guys are killing it i love it okay you guys are really on your game today all right so let's look at the adductor muscle now um in blue we got the hamstring portion over here and this portion originates from that ischial tuberosity and attaches to that the posterior aspect of that medial epicondyle of the femur. And because of this position, it goes straight down. It more so extends the hip when it contracts. And this portion of the adductor magnus is innervated by the tibial branch of the sciatic nerve. So we haven't talked about the sciatic nerve and how it's actually two nerves bunched into one, but we're gonna talk about it in a bit, especially when we get into the leg portion of the lecture series. But for now, just know that the hamstring portion, which extends the hip, is innervated by sciatic nerve. Now the adductor part of adductor magnus is innervated by the obturator nerve. Okay, And this part is called the adductor part because it adducts the hip when it contracts. So the same muscle doing two different things, irrespective of the joint position. And then of course, we talked about it before, the adductor hiatus, hiatus the hole in the muscle that allows important blood vessels and nerves to pass through. Awesome stuff. Okay, I want to briefly talk about the um, femoral triangle today. Um, I know I don't want to get too much into vascular structures for now, um, but it's, it's kind of cool to see, um, especially landmarking wise, why we have these triangles. So we're not actually built with a triangle but we created this as a reference point to kind of find different structures in the leg, especially when surgeons are doing surgery or if you're trying to cut through a cadaver, it's important to know these landmarks 
So the femoral triangle is a triangle that's created between the borders of the inguinal ligament that connects your ASIS to your pubis over here. So if I can just show you a diagram from lecture one, I'd be able to tell what that looks like. If I can find it, that is. Is this lecture one or two? Maybe it's in lecture two. Well, in any case, um, we have that inguinal ligament. So that's the, the superior border of the femoral triangle. And then the lateral border would be that sartorius muscle, that really long muscle over here. The medial border of that triangle would be the adductor longus muscle, okay? Now, within that triangle, we have very important structures that kind of course through it, okay? We got the femoral nerve, right? L234 kicks the door. We got the femoral artery in red, and then we got the femoral vein in blue. But we also have lymphatic structures at the medial most aspect that course through here as well. So lymphatic vessels are vessels that, you know, shunt fluids to and from different parts of the body, a body and they're involved in the immune system. Right, so I'm not going to get into too much detail because that's more so for uh, semester three organs. But for now, just know that we got the nerve, artery, vein, and lymphatic vessels. Now, an, e the, uh, an easy way to remember all that is the acronym NAVEL. So I'm going to type it down right now. So NAVEL is another way of saying the umbilicus or the belly button. And... If you go from lateral to medial, you got the N, which is the nerve, A, you got the artery, V, we got the vein, E is empty space in between the vein, and L, the lymph vessels, navel. So if you want to remember the contents of that femoral triangle, starting from lateral going down to medial, navel is a great way to kind of remember that. And now these vessels course through the leg, the artery and the vein course through the leg. And once they get to the back of the knee, they turn into the popliteal artery and vein, although it doesn't say that really, but it does. Awesome. Okay. I realized that there's only 15 minutes less left of lecture and I've only covered half of this lecture. Jeez. All right. Let's see how much more I can get of <laughs> this I can get done. Oh, wait, hold on. I think I didn't message everyone, Mabel. Okay, so let's take a breather. You guys are good. You're answering the questions really well today. Lateral thigh. So lateral meaning the outside of the thigh. Um, you guys are well aware of a lot of these muscles, which is good. We've talked about the IT band already in the tensor fascia lata and the anterior thigh lecture. Um, so let's orient ourselves a little bit. At the very top, we have that iliac crest, which is that bony top of your pelvis. Over here, we have the gluteus medius, which is the superior most muscle. You see, as you can see, it's the tallest muscle over here. So it's, it's the highest most, therefore we call it the superior most muscle. And then we get that big, bulky gluteus maximus over here. And there's a reason why we call it arguably the strongest muscle in the human body. I mean, look at the size of it, right? It generates the most force, that's for sure. And then anteriorly, the front of the body, we have the quads. So are we looking at the right or the left leg, by the way, guys? So let's see if you guys can figure this out. Are we looking at the right leg? Yeah, Teresa, so the tongue is pound for pound the strongest muscle. No, not the tongue, sorry, the jaw, the jaw muscle. Not the tongue muscle. The tongue is a muscle, but the jaw muscle is the strongest pound for pound. Overall though, muscle to muscle, the gluteus maximus is definitely the strongest. 
it generates the most force. Yep, we're looking at the right leg. You got it. Awesome. So we're looking at the right leg because we are looking at the IT band. We know that the IT band is the outside, the lateral most aspect of the leg. Versus if we saw the adductor muscles like gracilis, adductor magnus, brevis, longus, we'd say this is the left leg. Okay. Awesome. So I think we'll end off in the next couple slides, but let's start with the gluteus maximus. Okay. Um, it's the major hip extender muscle. So that's the muscle that brings your entire leg backwards if you're standing. Uh, again, I'll add those diagrams going forward. Um, it also does some external rotation. So it externally rotates the hip, but it's mostly just that big extender, right? And a good example of gluteus maximus is if you just look at a sprinter. Sprinters have really big gluteus maximus and they need it to generate that force to be able to run as fast as humanly possible, right? Um, it arises from the external border of that iliac crest over here. So we got the iliac crest that continues all the way along here. It also has borders onto the sacrum and the cossex too. So if you guys remember for the pelvis uh, lecture, we had that um, continuation of the spine into the pelvis called the sacrum. It originates from there as well. And the majority of the gluteus maximus inserts onto that tensor fascia lata. Sorry, not tensor. It starts up to the fascia lata as well as the IT band. So about three quarters. But it also inserts onto a quarter of it at least, it inserts onto that gluteal tuberosity. So let's go back to the femur. And that gluteal tuberosity would be right over here. And notice how thick that is. Long and thick because a big muscle is attaching to it. Um, again, we talked about being a really strong extender of the hip. It's innervated by the inferior gluteal nerve. Now, a lot of you, a lot of you might be wondering why it isn't innervated by something called the superior gluteal nerve. Um, but we're, we're talking more about position now. So, um, the gluteus maximus is actually inferior to the gluteus medius. And so gluteus medius gets innervation by that superior gluteal nerve versus the gluteus maximus getting inferior gluteal nerve innervation. Okay. So don't let that nerve confuse you. Okay. Now moving on to the gluteus medius. Um, it's that superior most muscle of the lateral thigh. Um, it's a major hip abductor. So it takes that leg while you're standing and it moves it directly to the side when it contracts in an open kinetic chain at least. And we'll talk about open versus closed kinetic chain in a bit, but that's what it does. Um, this muscle is often weak in a lot of people. Um, and that's because of poor activation of your glutes and over dominance of your groin muscles, hamstrings getting tight, piriform is working too hard. There's a lot of different reasons why the gluteus medius gets weak. Um, and it's one that I personally like to strengthen a lot, um, in my profession. And <laughs> a lot of you guys know this exercise, the clamshell. It's one of my favorite exercises. And it's because when it's done right, you actually don't need weights to cause really good activation in your gluteus medius, right? So the clamshell is a very, very, very interesting workout. I use it in all my clients who have weak gluteus mediuses to teach them how to turn on their gluteus medius. Okay. It'll also get piriformis a bit, but we're trying to target that gluteus medius to some extent. Okay. Another exercise that's really helpful in strengthening that gluteus medius is a side plank. The side plank will get it as well as your obliques, but the side plank will also get um, your gluteus medius. Okay. Now, it sits kind of between your gluteus maximus and your tensor fascia lata, but it's deeper to both of them, right? So you have to kind of cut through glute max and TFL to get to your gluteus maximus. Okay. So 
we're gonna look at the posterior thigh and this is the super the superficial aspect of it we're looking at the right leg right now um that cross over here is where your ischial tuberosity would be right so it's right underneath that gluteus maximus and that's a sitting bone that we have now remember before how i was talking about bursa and how they're those you know um little packets of cushion that sit between bone and uh, muscle we have three different bursa that's you know in between your gluteus maximus and your ischial tuberosity that helps kind of cushion the bone between the muscles so that there isn't a lot of friction okay and that's what helps us sit on our butts for long periods of time although that's kind of to our demise as well because we as humans sit too much in in these days but uh you know it's there to protect us and then we got uh, gluteus medius should be up here covered by some fascia gluteus maximus and we got the it band over here on the side and our last slide because i don't think we'll have time to get into the other ones but these are just kind of sections to give you an idea of the different layers so we've already talked about the gluteus maximus being innervated by that inferior gluteal nerve it's the superficial most if you look at the left diagram over here we got the posterior aspect of the right leg you got that big gluteus maximus and you can see how it's very continuous with that that it band over here now if you were to cut away the gluteus maximus you'd get what you see in the right diagram over here so this is the gluteus maximus over here being cut away we also have the gluteus medius and you can see how it's deeper to the gluteus maximus and that's innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. Now, if you cut it further, you'll get what, what is called the gluteal, gluteus medius muscle, which is even deeper to the, sorry, minimus, which is even deeper to the medius. Right over here. Right? And then if you go more inferior, we get the lateral rotator muscles. There's quite a bit of them, which we're going to talk about next time. But the gluteus minimus has a very similar function to the medius. And you can kind of see why. I mean, positionally, angle-wise at least, they have very similar orientation of fibers, um, me, minimus and medius, that is. Um, so they both abduct the hip. Okay. Um, obviously, medius minimus being smaller than maximus and not as strong but they're still pretty strong. They're still pretty bulky muscles. Now let's see what's the next. You know what, we'll finish off with this slide because I did want to talk about the functional aspect of the gluteus medius and maximus, or sorry, medius and minimus. Um, so we'll end off on this slide, guys. And this is this is a little bit interesting. So we, we just talked about how the gluteus medius and minimus cause abduction of your leg. So that's that movement taking your leg and moving it to the outside. So let's say you were to step on one leg, right? You have to kind of stabilize with that other leg. So the one leg has to step off. We're activating the medius and minimus in an open kinetic chain. Wait, I'm trying not to, let me make sure I'm not confusing open kinetic with uh, closed kinetic. Pretty sure closed kinetic though would be. Sure, I always get this confused. Yeah, so, sorry about that. So, in the open kinetic chain, the gluteus medius and minimus, when it contracts, would cause your hip to abduct to the side. And anytime we say open kinetic chain, that's when your upper body or lower body is leaving the floor. It's not making contact with the floor and reacting to the floor, okay? But the other leg, when you stand on one leg, is also activating its gluteus, medius, and maximus, but eccentrically, okay? And this is happening on a closed kinetic chain. So that stance leg is actually on the floor, and this muscle now has to activate to prevent the pelvis from dipping downwards, so tilting downwards in what we call a Trendelenburg posture. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But 
this muscle has to contract to keep the pelvic the pelvis level when it's on one leg. And why is that important? It's because walking, jogging, or running involves most of our time being spent on one leg. Now, when the gluteus maximus is weak, it leads to that Trendelenburg posture, and it puts the hip in a weird position, that puts the knee in a weird position, that puts your ankles in a weird position. Right, everything's a chain. So you can see that if you have a weak gluteus medius or minimus, that has implications down the chain as well. And what I did was I did a simple Google search. And if you guys can see the diagram over here to the right, here's a normal gluteus medius. So you see the person standing on the one leg over here, other leg off the floor. You see how the pelvis is still in line and horizontal. Now the Trendelenburg sign would be that if the pelvis started shifting downwards, the gluteus medius is not doing its job to stabilize the pelvis eccentrically. I hope that makes sense. But that's kind of the difference between having a strong gluteus medius and a weak gluteus medius. And that's why us physiotherapists are always on our clients' cases for strengthening these muscles because it has implications on the whole entire leg if they're weak. And if you're a runner and have small problem with your knee, it could be due to that. There are other factors as well. And you like I, I typically find that with gluteal medius and minimus weakness, it's never just that one thing. There's usually other things that coincide with glute gluteus medius and minimus weakness. And that's uh, tightness in your lateral thighs. So your vastus lateralis can get tight. Your vastus medialis oblique, the medial muscle of your thigh can get weak. Um, you can get pronation of your foot, which is the flattening of your foot, which can put excessive pressure in your knee. So without getting too confused in what I just said or like all the details, the moral of the story is the knee is usually the victim and not the cause of its own pain. The cause is usually at the hip or at the ankle. So um, to answer your question, it could very well be due to a weak gluteus medius. And there are a lot of ways to strengthen the gluteus medius. One of them I talked about being the clamshell but there are other ways to strengthen it more functionally as well, right? So single leg deadlifts are one way to strengthen it. Um, uh, side band shuffles, so putting a band around your ankles and shuffling side to side is another way to strengthen it. Um, there are different ways you could do it, and depending on functionally how you need to use your gluteus medius, um, I would strengthen it that way, right? So for a runner, let's say, I might actually do um, single leg deadlifts, but I would actually almost purposefully cause a Trendelenburg and get out of it, right? Um, just to kind of teach the muscle to get out of that Trendelenburg posture. So those are all things I'm thinking about when I'm trying to strengthen the gluteus medius at least. But yeah, it could definitely be involved in uh, knee pain. So that's today's lecture. I got through 14 of the 22 slides, so uh, great. I didn't finish it. But I will keep trying guys. So next lecture will be Thursday. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As always, it's a great pleasure to be able to kind of communicate with you guys and uh, teach you what I know about the human anatomy. Um, you guys are getting so much smarter and better. It's like, it's almost awesome to see the growth. And I know I don't really know you guys face to face, but I feel like we've interacted a lot. And based on the answers I'm seeing, you guys are understanding the human body so much more. And that to me is just, um, confirmation that um, things are going well and I'm really happy about that. So um, if you have any questions at all, I'll be here for the next five minutes. Otherwise, have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you guys all on Thursday to continue this lecture and then we're moving on. So the next lecture will continue with posterior thigh and we'll be moving into the, the leg. So the, the calf and the front of the shin region. So yeah, that's what we have to look forward to. All right, guys, so have an awesome day. I'll be here to take any questions for the next five to 10 minutes. And if not, I'll see you Thursday.